Go to Matthew chapter 6, find verse 5. We're going to continue on with our lesson. New subject we started last week entitled The Forgiven. Just like I shared with us earlier during healing that we are the healed. That's who we are. We also are the forgiven. If, if you've been purchased w with the blood of the lamb and, and you have received salvation by faith, you are the forgiven. That's who we are. But we spent all of our time in 1 Kings chapter 8 last week looking at the prayer of Solomon. And if you recall... In Solomon's prayer, forgiveness from heaven or, or heaven hearing was contingent on what man did in the earth. In other words, turning from wicked ways, then let heaven hear. Right? Forgiving our neighbor or forgiving one of, of their wrong toward you. Then let heaven hear. This is, this is the, the, the pattern we saw in, in Solomon's prayer. And Solomon prayed this prayer under the old covenant. He prayed it under the Mosaic law. And, and under the Mosaic law or under law, in order for God to forgive one, one would first have to forgive their brother or their sister or, or be 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 corrected, become corrected in their wrong or their error first, then heaven hear, then God would forgive. But the question is, is that how it operates now under grace? Or does it work a little bit differently? Well, before we answer this question, I want to look at two passages in the gospel accounts where Jesus is teaching his disciples on forgiveness. And it's interesting what he tells them. As a matter of fact, what he tells them shows us that his ministry was a bridge between testaments. The gospel was that bridge, the earthly ministry of Jesus, the, the New Testament, New Covenant message he taught his disciples and, and taught others was being ministered under the law. The, the law of Moses was still in effect. It was still in operation because again, Hebrews 9, 16 and 17 tells us what? That a testament has no power while the testator lives. It is not in force while the testator lives. It's not in force. It's not in power until after the testator dies. So, so you don't have the New Testament in force until Jesus dies. Now, again, as I've always enjoyed pointing out, the difference between the testator that Jesus is and any other testator of any other testament is that he didn't stay dead. He got up. And could witness his church operating in that New Testament now in operation, in power, in force. But there's something else that Jesus does during his earthly ministry. He would minister to individuals on their level. What do I mean by that? Well, well look at what he says about forgiveness here. And, 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 and let me know if it sounds similar to what Solomon prayed. In 1 Kings 8, Matthew 6, 5, it says, and when you pray, and when you pray, we covered some of this in our productive petition lesson. Our focus this time is on forgiveness, but a reason when you pray. Now, now he just got through teaching us about charitable deeds in Matthew 6, 1 through 4. He says, don't, don't, don't do your charitable deeds before men for the purpose of being seen by them. 
Don't do good deeds to be seen. And then he gets to verse 5 and says, and by the way, when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be what? Seen by men. So just like the charitable deeds, Jesus is saying what? Don't let, don't let the, the reason and the purpose of you praying, don't let that reason be to be seen by people and heard by people. That's why you're doing it. That's your, your motive. Now he says, surely I say to you, they have their reward. He says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So clearly Jesus is talking about motive. He, he's not saying one can't pray publicly. But why are you praying publicly? Or why are you praying before people? It's about the motive. Verse 7. And then, and then he says, and when you pray, do not use vain, empty, useless repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. We think God hears the wordy prayer, the, the articulate prayer. Clearly, that's the one God hears. The anointing is on, is on the articulate prayer, the lengthy prayer. No. They think they'll be heard for their many words. Now, what's the condition of the heart? When you're doing a charitable deed, what's the heart condition? When you're praying, what's the heart condition? Verse 8, he says, therefore, don't be like them. Now, remember, he's teaching his disciples, talking to his disciples under the law. The law is still in effect here. Don't be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And I've always wondered, God, if you already know what I need of, or if you already know what I have need of, before I ask you, why do I have to ask you? God's answer, because I said so. You know, there's that part. But also why? Because of how the kingdom operates. Asking and saying and calling for and speaking is essential to the life of the believer as we operate in the kingdom of God in this world. So, verse 9, we have what has been referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Now, you can't find one centimeter of a scripture that calls this the Lord's Prayer. It has been assumed. Now, if we're going to make an assumption, as I recently said, I believe I said this when I was in Atlanta, if, if it's going to be called anything, it should be called the disciples' prayer because it was the model. Everybody say model. model. Everybody say blueprint. blueprint. It's the model or blueprint he gave his disciples. You remember Luke's account where they ask him, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Jesus says, okay, I'll teach you how to pray. Here's the first thing you need to know when it comes to prayer. And when you pray, say. Amen. Say. Here, Matthew records the manner, the manner in which one would pray. Look at verse 9. In this manner, therefore pray. Meaning what? Pray like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight some points, Jesus says, that, that you could cover in prayer. Now, remember, he's teaching his disciples this. And when he's teaching his disciples this, the New Testament isn't in operation yet. He hadn't reached Calvary yet. So in this day, he says, in this manner, say what? Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Sacred is his name. Set apart is his name. Your kingdom come, your will be done 
Your will be done where? Don't read the rest yet. Your will be done where? On earth. On earth as what? Is it safe to assume Jesus just said that the will of God is done in heaven? Let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So the will of God is, the will of God is settled in heaven. Let it be settled on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. There's a request. There, there's, a, there's an ask. Uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A, a request for forgiveness. Uh, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, there are people today that pray this prayer. Anytime it's time to pray. They pray this. Amen. Now, now why, would, why would they do that? Because that's what they've been taught. They've been taught to, to pray this. It, it, worst case scenario, this is the fallback prayer. The problem is, is that the prayer doesn't compute on this side of the cross. Why doesn't it? Well, let me point out a couple of reasons why it wouldn't compute on this side of the cross. It would make sense on that side of the cross where the Old Testament was still in force, where the law was still in force, where the New Testament and grace had yet to be in operation. Here, here's, here's why. Uh, for example, uh, look at verse 13. And do not lead us into temptation. That wording is already a little strange. Because am I, am I, am I asking, if I were to pray this, would I be asking God? Don't lead me into temptation like you've led others into temptation. Does God lead us into temptation? Doesn't his word say yield not to temptation? Again, when you have these English translations, sometimes they just, they just, listen, how many of you were here for Rick Renner? So if you were here for Rick Renner, then you know some of the problems that the English translations have as a result from coming over from Greek. Sometimes some things just don't hit the target in translation. This probably would sound better if it was, do not allow us to be led into temptation. And even in that, it's still a little, what am I saying? God might allow... Let's really think about this. But the second part of this verse definitely doesn't compute on this side of the cross because it says, but deliver us from the evil one. If I were to pray this right now under the New Testament, I'd be requesting of God to be delivered from the devil, implying that I'm not delivered. But the same Bible in the New Testament, Colossians 1.13 says, For he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Saints, you are on this side of Calvary. You are the delivered. That's who you are. So if I'm delivered, I don't have to pray to God to deliver me from the devil when I'm already delivered from the devil. What I need to do is thank him for delivering me from the devil. This, this makes sense to pray pre-Calvary. It doesn't make sense to pray post-Calvary. Are you with me? Okay. Then... This 14th and this 15th verse. Listen to what Jesus, watch this. Listen to what Jesus tells his disciples under the law. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. Well, that's true. That's what Solomon prayed. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Well, well. Well, what Jesus said right here is right in line with the law of Moses. He, he didn't say anything different than what the prophets or the patriarchs or, or, or the kings of Israel said. It's no different. 
And it makes sense that he would tell them this during this time specifically. What we see in the earthly ministry of Jesus, we see, we see Jesus either ministering, ministering to them on their level, ministering to them something they have some familiarity with, or we see Jesus explaining the kingdom in parables, right? Or we see Jesus correctly interpreting the false understanding of the law that maybe the Pharisees or the Sadducees had. He would, he would deliver proper or correct interpretation and understanding. Much of what we see is a New Testament message. Things, though, that would not be in force until after Calvary. We see the same thing in Mark 11. Look. Mark 11, 25. As well as verse 26. What Jesus says here is just like what he said in verse 14 and 15 of Matthew 6. Here in Mark 11, 25 and 26. It says, and whenever you stand praying. Now, who was he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. We know he was talking to his disciples because you all remember the, the fig tree. Oh, I can't wait to, till I, can, I get to teach you all about the fig tree. Right? Jesus wanted something to eat. Fig tree didn't have anything. He said, curse you, die. No one's eating from you ever again. You're done. Well, the next day, Jesus says, Master, the, 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 the tree you cursed, the tree in which you said, wither away, let no one eat fruit from you again, it's dead. You can tell that Peter is like, oh, my goodness, you just said something to this tree yesterday, and what you said yesterday, we now see it in fruition. And what does Jesus say? He says, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, if you speak to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart, uh, you'll have what you say. Literally, what was Jesus saying? He, he was modeling the confession of faith for them and saying, you too can speak to the tree or the mountain in your life. He then says, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. This is what he's teaching his disciples while the Old Testament is still in force. And then he says in this verse, and when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father can do something. So that your father can what? In heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you don't forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. What we see in these two verses here in Mark 11 is exactly what he taught in Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. Which is right in line with Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8. In other words, I must forgive you so God can forgive me. Watch this. That's law forgiveness. That's old covenant forgiveness. I submit to you under the New Testament, we have something better. We have something better. Let's keep going. Let's take a look at the psalmist. How many of you know the, the psalmist, David specifically, was, was often very prophetic I believe Peter actually, he, he refers to him as a prophet or, or refers to his prophecy over in Acts chapter 2. And so here's one of the many things that the Spirit of God inspired David to, to prophesy. Because, because while we're accustomed to certain individuals being prophets, like we know Isaiah is a prophet. Well, we know Ezekiel is a prophet. Right? We know Jeremiah is a prophet, but Jesus taught about the blood of the prophets from Abel to Zechariah. Oh, Abel was a prophet. Yeah, David was a prophet. As a matter of fact, when Moses was commissioned by God to free his people from Egyptian bondage, and Moses started coming up with excuses as to how he may not be qualified to do this, which 
is the point. None of us are qualified on our own merit. He said, I, I, I got a bit of a stammering issue. He said, no problem. Aaron will be your voice. He will be your prophet. So David was prophetic, I would even say, a prophet. And here in Psalm 32, look at the 32nd Psalm, verse 1 and 2. Now, this is David, watch this. This is David saying this under the old covenant. Look at what he's saying here. Blessed is he who's what? Is what? I want to make sure none of us miss this. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. It sounds like David is talking about a, a blessed man in which this has happened in advance. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. This was prophetic because we're going to now make our way to Romans chapter 4. Look here in verse 5. And you'll see Paul quoting David. Romans 4, verse 5. And mind you, it's Paul who, beginning in chapter 3, starts to make the distinction for us between law and grace. Between salvation or justification according to the law and salvation and justification according to grace. Remember, remember Romans 3.21 where he says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law. Meaning what? The righteousness of God that can only be acquired by faith. That can only be received by faith. That's grace righteousness. That's grace justification. So here in chapter 4, verse 5, Paul says what? But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Paul brings up David. He's getting ready to bring up Abraham. These were individuals who believed God, and God did what? He accounted it to them for righteousness. Verse 6, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness, watch this, apart from works, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Paul just quoted David back in Psalm 32, verses 1 through 2, which means what David was speaking was something that was prophetic. David, in the book of Psalms, was giving us and his audience of the day, those who would be reading and, and who would be blessed by what the Spirit of God inspired him to write, were getting a glimpse of grace forgiveness. They were getting a, a glimpse of grace righteousness. Okay. Now let's, let's look into what grace forgiveness looks like. It, it looks a little bit like law forgiveness, but you got to pay attention to the wording so that you can see the difference. Some of you have heard me teach on this before. But it never hurts to read again because faith comes by hearing, not by having heard. Peter said, as long as I'm in this tent, what am I going to do? I'm going to stir you up by reminding you. Oh, wait a minute. If I'm reminding you, you've heard it before. Now, I'm, I'm trying to think of how many times in, in Scripture, especially the New Testament, where I see certain actions that result in us being stirred up. Now, there's only two I can think of in particular. One is where Paul says that he would lay hands on Timothy to stir up the gift in him. The only other time I can recall it is when Peter says, I'm going to stir you up by reminding you. That means you've heard it before, which tells us that we're supposed to hear the God over and over and over again. We, we, we really see God is is new and he's the same, which is why 
you should be okay with hearing new stuff and you should be okay with hearing old stuff. Look here in Ephesians 4, 32. And let's get this picture. Let's, let's, let's look at this picture of grace forgiveness. Now, remember what we read in Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. Remember what we read in Mark eleven twenty-five 25 and 26. Remember that what Jesus teaches his disciples in that moment and in that context is exactly what Solomon prayed in 1 Kings chapter 8. Why are the words of Solomon's prayer and the words of Jesus when teaching his disciples on forgiveness, why are they in harmony? Because it's under the law. But what about forgiveness under grace? What does that look like? Are you in Ephesians? Find chapter 4. If I didn't tell you yet, Ephesians 4. All right, 5 verse 32, don't read it yet. In verse 17 of this same chapter, Paul talks about putting on the new man. Lay aside the old man and the deeds of the old man, put on the new man and live according to the new man. The, the new man is the, is the born again you. Your spirit is new. Your spirit has been made new. Your flesh is still old. One day our flesh will be saved. It's called the resurrection. But until then, our unsaved flesh and our saved spirit are in constant conflict. Constant. Never ending, never ceasing conflict. It's a daily battle. Now, if we equip ourselves with the right tools, we'll see to it that the spirit part of us wins the war. But there are many battles and skirmishes between the unsaved flesh and the saved spirit, which is why Paul says, walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He even tells us in the 19th verse of Galatians 5, he says, the works of the flesh are evident. They are obvious. You can't miss them. And he has another list here. In Ephesians 4, beginning with this 17th verse, where, where he, talks about, he talks about what it means to, to live according to, to your spirit, your, your recreated spirit, to live as the new man. And, and he mentions some things that you, you got to put off and you got to put away. Paul is notorious for this. He really does it in, in Colossians chapter 3. That's the scripture that we'll look at next, where he talks about put off and then put on. So we get to the end of this chapter here in Ephesians 4, and we see what grace forgiveness looks like. Again, what did Jesus teach his disciples under the law? He taught them what they were familiar with. That in order for my Father in heaven to forgive me of my trespasses, I must first forgive of trespasses. Oh, but look at this. Ephesians 4, 32. Here's the latter part of all the things Paul tells us we should be doing. And he says what? And be kind to one another. Put a pin there. What's so hard about this? Why is this such a challenge? I know why it's a challenge for unbelievers. That's their filthy nature. And you would even think, I mean, it, it, it really, it doesn't take a lot of effort to be kind. I don't know why every driver on the road is in a hurry all the time. As if it's the end of the world to let me over. What is so challenging about that? Why do so many drivers not allow you to get over Push the gas just to then push the brake because the light's red. It's right there. See all the brake lights right here? You, 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 you went nowhere fast. Why is it so hard at the airport to let 
the person near you get one of the crates to put their belongings in to go through. You just got to get them all first. Everybody's in a rush. Got to get, I got to be first. I got to get there first. I kid you not, I've done it in the airport where I've allowed someone to go before me and they've looked at me like I was from another world. Why? Because they're not used to kindness. They're not used to people being kind. It's, it's that thank you where they're like, th 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 thank you. <laughs> what? So for believers, it should not be difficult to simply be kind to one another. That's a fruit of your born again spirit. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted. Yeah, men, we can be tenderhearted. That's not a blow to our masculinity to be tenderhearted. It's, it's biblical. What does it say next? Forgiving one another. You know what? Let me start. Let me start this scripture over. Let me start this scripture over. Here, here we go. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another so God can forgive you. Right? That's what it says, right? Let me try again. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another so that God in Christ will forgive you. That's not what it says? That's not what it says. I'm not reading this correctly. Let me try again. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, Mr. Apostle Paul here, sir, um, this sounds a little bit different than what Solomon prayed. Solomon was praying that we would write ourselves on this plane so that heaven would then hear and God would then forgive. But that's not what I see here under the New Testament. I, I, I'm seeing some, these words are slightly different than what Jesus taught his disciples in Mark 11 and Mark 6, which lets us know what he was teaching them. Because we know that Paul would not be in opposition to what the master teacher would teach. So that tells us, oh, all Jesus was doing was sharing with disciples who lived under the old covenant, old covenant forgiveness. And how, again, does old covenant forgiveness work? I need to forgive you so God can forgive me. But that's not what Paul said. Paul said, I'm going to forgive you because God already forgave me. He did it through Christ. This is why this message is called The Forgiven, because the moment you step into Jesus, you step into forgiveness. I, I, as much as you are the saved, the healed, the delivered, the set for you are the forgiven. Let me read it again. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why am I forgiving you? How dare Fred not forgive you when God through Christ forgave me? I wasn't owed forgiveness. It's because of the grace of God. How dare I sit at the table of the Lord harboring unforgiveness in my heart? I haven't forgiven others. I haven't forgiven me. How dare me? When God's already forgiven me in Jesus. When I said yes to Jesus, I said yes to forgiveness. Oh, look at what he says in Colossians. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 13. Now here Paul's doing the same thing. Paul, he starts off in verse 6. He, first, no, actually he starts off at the beginning of the chapter. He says, set your mind on things above. Set your mind on, on heavenly things. Set your mind on godly things, not on earthly things. It doesn't mean we don't engage with earth, earthly things, but where is our mind set? Our mind is set on things above. He talks about this mindset on things above, and then he says, put to death your members. 
That's what he says in verse 6. He tells us, put to death your members. But he doesn't list members. He lists what the members can do. And he talks about sexual immorality and malice and a number of things. And then he gets to verse 8. And he says, and then on top of that, put off all of these. Put them off. Put off anger. Put off wrath. The anger that leads to wrath. It's okay to be angry just as long as you sin not. You can be righteously indignant. But don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Because that's going to lead to murder. He says, put off, all, put off filthy language. Y'all know what filthy language is? Put it off. I know sometimes you want to put it on. My mama probably wouldn't want to hear this, but I want to put on filthy language daily. <laughs> I want to drive points home with filthy language. Actually, in those contexts, I don't even consider it to be filthy. I consider it to be strong. Right. See, filthy language, you just got a foul mouth. There's no reason or cause for profanity, and you're just letting them come out of your mouth. But sometimes my flesh says... The annoyance that you're experiencing right now requires a very strong adjective. <laughs> but even in that, I got to stab this flesh. I got to maim it. I got to arrest my tongue. Yeah, he says, put off anger, wrath, malice, filthy language. Then he starts to get to the stuff you need to put on. He talks about putting on tender mercies, putting on kindness. And then actually he gets to verse 14 and he says, but above all, put on love. That's the easiest thing for us to do. If you would just put on love, you would automatically put on everything else he said to put on and put off everything else he said to put off if you just put love on. That's verse 14. But we get to verse 13. Look at what it says. It says, bearing with one another. That's patience. Come on, saints, where's your patience at? Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Now, I want to make sure that I'm reading this right. So you all correct me if I happen to read this incorrectly. Verse 13 again, Colossians 3, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even so Christ will forgive you, so you also must do. No. Again, I botched this one up too. Oh, is, is it the same word we read in Ephesians 4.32? Forgave? Already done. Oh, okay. Let, let, let me try this again. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So anytime someone asks you, why are you forgiving them? The answer is simple, because Christ forgave me. Sometimes we felt like we didn't deserve someone's forgiveness, but they chose to operate in grace and love. Because Christ forgave me. I'm not forgiving you so I can be forgiven. I'm forgiving you because I am forgiven. And John will drive this home for us. First John, chapter 2, find verse 12. Are you there? All right. What does John say here? He says, I write to you who? Stop right there. Who is he talking to? He's talking to us. I'm a little children. You're a little children. Because we're children of God. And John was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and a father in the faith. So he says what? I write to you, little children. This is how we know he's not writing to the world. He's not talking about sinners. Sinners, sinners aren't. I can't believe in 2024 secular folks still like saying we're all God's children. No, y'all ain't. No, you're not. No. 
to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe. Amen. You want to be a child of God, you got to believe. Believe on who? Believe on Jesus. If you're not believing on Jesus, you don't be no child of God. You might be a child of the earth. You might be a creation of God, but you're not a child of God. You got to be born again to be a child of God. So John is writing the children of God. And he says what? He says, my little children, I write to you. Why? Because your sins are going to be forgiven. No, not going to be. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for my name, his name's sake. Did John just call me the forgiven? Did he just call you the forgiven? He said, I write to you because you're, I don't write to you so your sins will be forgiven. I don't write to you to tell you how you can get your sins forgiven. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. That alone should be enough. I don't care what somebody did to you. See, we always got to put things in perspective. Now, I'm not talking about dropping your guard or using wisdom. And with some people, you might have to give them an allotment of time before you let them back in your space. Matter of fact, you got to protect your space. We know space being protected is important. Jesus protected his space. You all remember Jairus and, and, and uh, the ruler of the synagogue whose, whose daughter, when Jairus came to Jesus, he said, my daughter is near death. Come with me so you can heal her. Well, as he's making his way to the house of Jairus, here comes the woman with the issue of blood. So we spend a little time on her. She gets forgive, um, um, She gets healed. She gets delivered. By the time Jesus makes it to the house of Jairus, his daughter is what? Dead. Jesus put everybody out and took in who he knew he could trust. Peter, come on, as fickle as you are, get in here. But he put the rest out. So he protected his space. So there's nothing wrong with protecting your space. But there is something wrong with harboring unforgiveness. Here's the perspective. What mess have you done? And I'm not really talking about the mess you did to someone or the mess someone saw. I'm talking about all that mess only you know about. Did God forgive you for all that mess? All that muck and that mire? That alone should be enough for us to walk in forgiveness towards one another, being that we're walking in divine forgiveness because of Jesus. I write to you, little children, why? Because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Okay, that's three verses. That's out of the mouth of three. Paul to the Ephesians, Paul to the Colossians, John to the church. As Christ forgave you, as God in Christ forgave you, I write to you because your sins are forgiven you. I am the forgiven. Well, how am I supposed to carry myself? Look in 2 Corinthians. Go to chapter 2 and find verse 3. Have you ever heard people say things like, forgiveness isn't for them, it's for you? <laughs> that is true in part. That's not, the, that's not the whole of it. There's more to it. Have you ever heard of unforgiveness as a, as a clogger of blessings or blocker of, of it would, more like a, a hinderer from you experiencing the blessing you're already in? You, this is why Paul, and this is why I pray it all the time, Paul in, in Romans chapter 15 or chapter 16 talks about the fullness of the blessing. 
the moment we're born again, we're blessed. But we may not be experiencing the fullness of the blessing because of certain things we're doing or still doing or we're, 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 I'm hurting me. I'm hindering me. I'm seeing some goodness, but I'm not seeing goodness in its fullness. And, and so forgiveness or the lack thereof, unforgiveness, can, can be a, a, a strong hinder. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, are you there? Look at this. It says, and I wrote this very thing to who? To you now, of course, to you, church at Corinth, but also those called to be saints. I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come or when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy. Well, that, that's, that's major right there. I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those whom I should be having, I should be experiencing joy over and joy for. Having con confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. It's okay, Paul, go ahead and be severe. Look what he says. If anyone has caused grief, he hasn't grieved me. But all of you to some extent. Verse 6, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him. Lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Oh, so forgiveness isn't just about me. It's about him too. Verse 8, therefore... I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. This is, this is an overt action. This is, this is going out of your way to do. I'm going out of my way to say I love you. To say, hey, hi, how you doing? How's your day? How's, how's the family? Verse 9. For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should what? Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Now we've read this verse standalone. But now we see why Paul said, lest Satan should take advantage of you. It had to do with forgiveness. You mean to tell me the unforgiveness that I harbor in my heart will allow Satan to take advantage of me? Sounds to me like unforgiveness is satanic. For we are not what? Ignorant. So he has devices. Devices simply translates into schemes and strategies. We're not ignorant of we know how he works. And since we know how, it, how he works, it's worse when we allow him to work what we know he works. We, we know how the devil operates. And we'll still allow ourselves to be caught up in his devices. This was about forgiveness. I mean, look at what he says here. You know, Paul, representation of a church father like John. Now, he didn't write this so that the Catholic Church could create priests to absolve people of sins. That's not what this is. 
when he says, here, I have forgiven that one for your sakes. There's only one mediator between God and man, that's Jesus. I don't have to go through clergy or I don't have to go through the collar to get my forgiveness. I can go straight to God by way of Jesus. But, but Paul was speaking in a substitutionary context, very similar to, to Jesus. And he says again, lest Satan should what? Take advantage of us. This had to do with forgiveness. How about, how about Luke 6, 38? Anyone know that scripture? Luke 6, 38. What does it say? Given it shall be or will be given to you. Good measure. I like how that sounds. Press down. Press down. That sounds like I'm, I'm making more room. Shaking together, running over. I like that. <laughs> will be put into your bosom, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The traditional says, shall men give into your bosom. I like how that sounds. With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. But did we read verse 37? Did we read verse 37? Now, what this has to do, this has to do, this is not, this is not do this or don't do this so God can do this or not do this. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus is teaching about a law that God already put in the earth. The law is here. You and I choose to cooperate with it. As a matter of fact, we may be cooperating with it and not even realizing we're cooperating with it. Oh, yeah, give. And we've commonly heard this in the context of, 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 of the offering, right? Give money and money shall be given to you. And there's truth to that because Paul said, whatever one sows, so shall that one reap. But look at verse 37. Judge not and you shall not be judged, which means we can read it this way. Judge and you'll be judged. This is not talking about judge not so God won't judge you. Uh-uh. This is talking about cooperating with the law that's already here. This is man's responsibility. Remember, shall men give into your judge not and what? You won't be judged. Condemn not, you won't be condemned, which means if you do condemn, you'll be condemned. And if you're wondering why everybody's judging you and everybody's condemning you, is it possible that you're the first up to judge and condemn others? Why is everybody judging me? Because you judge everybody. Just go in a corner and judge you. Go in a closet, turn the lights off, close the door, and just judge you. Well, look at the rest of this scripture. Forgiven what? You'll be forgiven, which means forgive not and you won't be forgiven. This is not talking about what we read in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 and 1 John 2. This is talking about with men. Now, this is the worst place we can find ourselves. Here I am, a born-again believer, filled with the Holy Spirit, having entered into divine forgiveness. I'm already forgiven, and I have the nerve to not forgive you. Then wonder why later on in life no one's forgiven me. This is talking about shall men give into your bosom. So not just money, judgment, condemnation, and forgiveness as well. How awful is that? To be forgiven by God and to walk in unforgiveness with my fellow man, my neighbor, my brother. And then when I'm in need of forgiveness, I can't find it anywhere. Because instead of forgiving, all I did was judge and condemn. That's why it reads, judge not, condemn not, but then it reads forgive. How come he didn't keep it all knots? Oh, no. 
a good portion of people that don't like to forgive are people that like to judge and condemn. And how dare we judge, how dare we condemn, and how dare we not forgive? Who do we think we are? I guess we'll have to find out next time. <laughs> Hallelujah.